welcome this morning to Lighthouse Baptist Church. We're so glad that you're uh, being a part of this worship service with us, whether you're sitting around your computer or around the telephone. I ask you to just get all the family together right now, and let's worship the Lord together this morning. I, I know this is a little different. Our church seats are empty, but the Lord is here with us today. You know, we are the church. Satan may think that he has stopped this church by causing us to stay away from the building, but I'm glad to report to you today, Satan cannot stop the church, for we are built upon the solid rock, Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ, right. the Son of the living God. So we welcome you this morning, and I pray that when this pandemic is over with, that you will come visit with us here at Lighthouse, 205 Pace Road in Hiram. We welcome our visitors. We thank you always for coming to be a part of it with us today. But this morning, Sister Selena is going to be singing for us. And I know you're going to be blessed as always. Selena is such a blessing here to all the congregation at Lighthouse. And so she's going to come and sing for us. And after she sings, we'll be back with a message this morning. an old song that maybe some of you know and maybe some of you don't. But with everything going on in life today, we still all have our storms. We all have the very obvious yeah. coronavirus storm that we're all worried about, but there's individual storms that we're still going through, and God can calm and will calm every single one of them. Yes, he will. going to happen as they crossed 
the sea. He knew it did not catch him by surprise, the storm that was about to come. But they, he gave them a promise, and that was, I'll meet you on the other side. I will meet you on the other side. Though the boat was tossed, I believe the sails were torn, and I believe the sailors were, were upset, were scared. But Jesus was there with them. Now, I want you to notice one thing in verse number 32. The very minute Jesus stepped in the boat, the winds ceased. When he stepped in the boat, the storms calmed down. When Jesus gets in your boat, I believe the storms will cease. Amen. And we will see the peace that we need. Without a doubt, as Selena saying, there's a storm though that's going on. We're in, uh, we're in a, a, a trying time right now. The coronavirus has dramatically changed our lives. It's been classified as a pandemic. And if you look the word up, you'll see it means a plague. Extreme actions are being taken to contain this disease. It's driving the stock market down. It's affecting commerce, travel, entertainment, sports. But I'm glad President Trump came one day and he said, this is a national emergency. This virus is affecting everyone in every way, regardless of their age, regardless of their status. It's affecting our businesses. It's affecting our school systems. It's affecting our hospitals. It's affecting our nursing homes, even affecting our funeral homes. But the worst thing I see today, it's trying its best to affect our churches. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about the plagues, and it teaches us as Christians how we are to respond to these situations. Listen, I'm not a doom and gloom preacher, and I don't want you to think this is the message of gloom, because I have good news for you, and our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Three things I'm going to share with you today right quickly. First of all, it's something we've been hearing over and over again, and that is simply exercise, caution, and common sense. But did you know the Bible teaches this? Over in the book of Luke, chapter 4, we find Satan here tempts Jesus and takes him on the pinnacle of the temple and says, jump off. I know the angels will protect you. But Jesus said, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. You see, we have been guilty, I believe, of trying to force God's hand. And friend, that is foolishness. It's tempting God. G. Campbell Morgan wrote, the moment we do something to prove God, we are proving that we are not sure of God. Trust never employs tricks to find out whether the one trusted is trustworthy. It's one thing to take a bold step of faith and obedience, and it's another thing to tempt God and act foolish for our own desires as Satan wants us to do. In the book of Numbers, chapters 13 and 14, when Israel uh, had, had come out of Egypt and they come to Kadesh Barnea, God had given them this land flowing with milk and honey and told them to go in and to possess it. When the 12 spies were sent into the land, 10 of them came back and said, there's no way we could ever do this. But I want you to notice what in verse number 30 of chapter of Numbers 13, Caleb says, let's go possess it. We can overcome it because God said we could. Amen. You see, this nation Israel had been blessed. But because, now get this, because of unbelief and because of murmurings against their leader for following God's orders, they failed to go into this land that's flowing with milk and honey. I pray God give us enough common sense to see those who are trying to help us and pray for them instead of hurting them and talking about them. In the book of John chapter 8, the Jews picked up stones to throw at Jesus to try to kill him. He could have worked a miracle right here. He could have paralyzed those people. He could have struck them dead. But see what Jesus did is exactly what we're hearing today as a word of caution. Jesus, now get this, Jesus distanced himself. He slipped through the crowd and he got away. John 8, 59 says, then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself 
and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. He distanced himself from the crowd. He was using caution. I look over also in 2 Corinthians, where the apostle Paul, and we see the authorities were trying to kill him. But Paul used some cautions here, and he used a little common sense. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. Now I believe God could have right here done something very impressive. But in this case, Paul was just simply to use the practical means that were available to him. My point is simply this, church. We must simply act with caution and not in presumption. Presumption is driven by subtle pride. Faith acts in humble obedience. Listen, you cannot do wrong when you go with God. We've heard many practical, cautious things over the news the last couple of weeks. And we are told that we need to be very cautious as we face this pandemic. Here's some advice that I want to just share again with you today from the authorities. We are to be more diligent about washing our hands, using hand sanitizers, and avoiding touching our face. We are to minimize exposure to large crowds, maybe even cut back on some activities, limit unnecessary travel. In other words, just use some common sense. The medical profession is even recommending that we keep a six-foot distance from others when in public. And if we get a flu-like symptom, he said we need to consult our doctor quickly than we normally do. And most of all, listen to this. We need to store up a few supplies. I didn't say hoard them up. I said store them up and be uh, reasonable about these things. These are just practical, common sense things that we should be using. But there are two extreme things that we need to avoid today. And that one is because we're God's children does not mean we do not have to deal with any of the problems that are going on. You see, belonging to God does not exempt us from the human experiences. Right. We know God will take care of us as we trust Him and obey Him. But we need to just be practical about these things. The second thing is, avoid panic. 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says, God has not given us the spirit of fear. I like what the psalmist wrote in Psalms 27. The Lord is my life and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I speak after that I dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. In other words, don't panic. God is in control. He's in control. We just need to turn to Him and trust Him in all things. Someone said, but preacher, I'm getting a little bit anxious about all this. What shall I do? We'll read God's Word. Let the Holy Spirit bring that assurance and bring the comfort to your heart. The Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is not fear, but it is faith and peace. Right. Isaiah 26 says, Thou will keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. We don't have to react to the problems like the world is, because we know God is with us. We just need to look to him as our source and our protection. Amen. These are just things that we need to be cautious of and use some common sense. But the Bible also says that we need to seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Every crisis that's ever come has been a call for us to seek God. 
Sometimes events will happen as a wake-up call. The wars, World War I and II, the Korean War, Vietnam War, all these wars. I think back of September 11. I think of the earthquakes and the floods and the fires. All of these. This is a wake-up call for us, church, yeah. to get back and seek the Lord yeah. while he may be found. I see over in, in the Old Testament, Israel was God's chosen people. But at times, they become very slack in their service to him. They took God for granted and his goodness for granted. And sometimes, the children of Israel would even go into idolatry. But rather than immediately wiping them out for their disobedience, God would send troubles to get their attention. I believe God is trying to get our attention today, church. Throughout America, he's trying to get our attention. Before Jerusalem was captured by Babylon in 586 B.C., there were other attacks that should have served as warnings to the children of Israel. Eleven years earlier, Jerusalem was attacked, and their king Jehoiakim was taken captive. Eight years prior to that, the Babylonians attacked and took away the captives, which Daniel was a part of this captivity. But in between those events was an opportunity for them to repent. God gave enough of a crisis to get their attention, and then he gave them an opportunity to seize those opportunities, to seize and to come to a time of repentance. 1 Corinthians 10 11 says that these things were written for our admonition. You see, what I'm preaching this morning, what others are preaching today, we're preaching this to get our attention, to be cautious. Admonition means be cautious about these things. My prayer today is for our country to respond to this current crisis with all of our resources, but seek the Lord first in all things. Amen. You see, it's one thing to have confidence in trusting in the Lord, and it's another to pridefully think we can handle the matter ourselves. Just because we have some great scientists and doctors and because there's a great deal of knowledge and all the advancements, it was a comfort to me to hear the president declare a national day of prayer. He realizes the hope we have is in praying to this almighty God that we serve. We should be praying every day for God's wisdom and God's protection. We should look to the Lord for victory and not assume we can handle these things without Him. There is victory in Jesus and Jesus alone. You leave out Jesus, you'll go down in defeat. In times past, we boasted of all of our achievements in this country. For instance, all the medicines, and I thank God for these doctors and nurses and the, and the people that we have coming in together to work for these things. The medicines, the vaccines for smallpox, for anthrax, for rabies, diphtheria, for meningitis, and they're working now for a, a vaccine for this virus. But people, listen, we are living among the people that are dying every day. Yeah. Every day we live, we're getting closer to eternity. We are living in a time when we're getting, I know we don't like to think about getting older, but we are every day we live. We're getting closer as Christians. We're getting closer home. Yeah. People are thinking, though, today they are invincible. They're going to live forever. They even boasted one day of building a ship that would not sink. Of course, we know what happened there. But the principle holds true for all nations and for all individuals. Proverbs 16 and 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We need God today, church. We need God in our, in our country. We need God in our, in our homes and in our churches again. We need God in all things. Amen. I know we've been hearing a lot of the scriptures of 2 Chronicles in chapter 7. The passage here in verse 13 begins with a situation in which trouble has come. Listen to what God said. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence or a plague among my people. 
There, there's trouble all around us. But yet God gives us a, a solution, and that's found in verses 14 and 15. Here it is. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that's made in this place. If we want a healing in our land, we need to get back to praying and asking God for these things. But he begins here with a humbling ourselves. It sounds real courageous for someone to stand up in this crisis and say, we can defeat this. It would be great to be like Caleb was at Kadesh Barnea when he said, if the Lord delights in us, then we will bring us into this land and give it to us. We need this type of attitude. With the Lord's help, we will make it. In a crisis, we should be humbling ourselves, not boasting of our self-sufficiency. A pandemic should remind us that we're just mortal people and we need God in all things. We need to humble ourselves. And we need to pray here. Pray, he said. Pray to God. Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, Be careful or be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Here's the promise of peace that he gives us. Pray with thanksgiving and let our requests be made known to God. Speak to God and let Him know, first of all, we depend upon Him. When the church forsakes her calling to be a house of prayer, God sends something to turn the church back to where it should be. Pray and listen, prayer does work. It will work in our country today. Amen. We need more than just putting on masks and washing our hands. We need to seek the Lord for His solution. We need his wisdom, his guidance, his power to work on our behalf. We need to pray. We need to seek his face, he said. We must seek the right relationship with God. It's not just that we tell him what we want, but we need to submit ourselves to him and follow his will. Yeah. As we're faced with, in times past and, and even in our present time, our religious liberties being taken away from us. Churches started to pray. I remember some time back, Franklin Grail began to lead prayer meetings in the, in the capitals. God heard these prayers, and God gave us a reprieve from that oppression. That was an opportunity, I believe, for the church to start praying instead of entertaining. A time to pray instead of entertaining. We're changing our, our pulpits into stages. We're changing our church worship into times of entertainment. Listen, our future depends far more on what the church does than what the politicians do. We need God, and we need to seek His face. Right. In Revelations chapters 2 and 3, we see Jesus walking among the candlesticks, and He's, he's assessing the condition of the church. He's pronouncing judgment based on what the church is doing. I wonder what will happen in the next few months. What will the church do? Will we get a further reprieve or will we get what we deserve? Listen, if a remnant will pray and seek God, he will hear and heal our land. Amen. Second uh, Chronicles 7 14 says, in answer to prayer, here's what God will do. God said, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. We can all agree on this. We need a healing in our land of unjust judges. He can heal our land of unjust laws. He can heal our land of economic chaos. He can heal our land of this virus that's spreading wildly today. We all agree we need deliverance from this virus, but we must not leave God out of this picture. Perhaps God's brought us to this place today for such a time as this. Perhaps this worldwide wake-up call is an opportunity of a lifetime. We need to pray and seek His face. He also says in verse 14, we need to turn from our wicked ways. 
You see, when God struck Egypt with the plagues, he was not just dealing with the people. He was dealing with their gods that they served. God's judgment devastated Egypt's economy. And we're seeing the impact of this coronavirus in the end times. God has to shake things to bring us back to the very basics. He said over in the book of Amos chapter 4, God begins to plead with the people. And he goes over the chastisements he sent upon them. And it was to bring them back to their senses. But the people failed to repent. God worked to bring them in a right relationship with their creator. I can almost hear the sadness in God's heart as he repeats these words over and over in Amos 4. Yet you have not returned to me. Some might say, oh, God wouldn't do that. He's a good God. Oh, listen. He does all of these things because he is a good God. Right. You see, it's all designed to bring us back into a, a right relationship with him. Our eternal relationship with him is far more important yeah. than our temporal comfort is. Amen. Nothing could be more sobering than the words we hear God speak in Amos 4 and 12. Prepare to meet thy calm. We need to exercise caution. Use common sense. We need to seek the Lord. And the last thing is, we should trust the Lord. Yeah. I still believe we are surrounded by God's protection. And I believe that he's able to work all things together for our good. Yeah. He's able to redeem any situation for our good and for his glory. In Genesis chapter 50, we read the story of Joseph and his brothers. The terrible things they did to him, setting him into slavery, all because of jealousy. The very intention behind their actions was evil. But Joseph trusted God. And in the end, Joseph could look to his brothers and say, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. You see, God's always seeking to save that which is lost. We must trust God for our protection, but we also need to keep praying for God's mercy on the lost, dying world. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. If a crisis can cause people to turn to God and receive eternal life, and if a crisis can cause a church to get back right with God, then praise God, something good has come out of this crisis. Amen. We seek the Lord for His mercy. His protection, His healing. And at the same time, we know the most important issue is for everyone to know where they're going to spend eternity. And I pray they will know today they're going to heaven because they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. When we are in the center of God's will, there is nothing to fear. I've seen Psalms chapter 91 on Facebook over and over again. And I firmly believe every word of it. That he is able to shield us if we look to him for that protection. God used the first three plagues in Egypt to do a work on his people as well as to judge Egypt. But when that work was done, he made a distinction between his people and the Egyptians. He protected his people from the destruction. The Egyptians had those plagues upon them was destruction. For God's people, the result was their redemption. The key factor I believe in this last plague was the blood on the doorpost. A type of the blood of Christ that's applied to the believer's heart. When God saw the blood, he passed over his people as a protection and they were not harmed. I like what Psalmist David said in Psalms 20 verse 7. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. We need to make sure this morning that the blood of Christ has been applied to our hearts. Make sure you surrender your life to Him. Trust Him to watch over you, empower you by His Spirit, and to minister peace and healing to you and to the others. Listen, the enemy may cause us to close the doors of this church building, but he cannot stop the church. Thank God I'm glad I can say He is the eye of my sword. He's in the midst of my fire. He's promised He'd be with me through temptation's darkest hour. And though I may not see Him, yet His presence is so near. That's why I can trust Him when He says, Child, have no fear. I'm glad Jesus said to His disciples, Meet me over on the other side.
outside. There's a storm brewing right now in our country. But listen, Jesus is still on the throne. And I would ask you right now, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, wherever you are, bow your head and just ask the Lord to come into your heart. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins and save your soul from the devil's hell. I thank you this morning for tuning in and for listening and worshiping with us. We're going to close now with the word of prayer. And we pray that everyone that's been watching and listening today will know without a shadow of a doubt, Jesus Christ is your Savior. Father, thank you this morning for this time that we can spend sharing the Word of God and sharing the hope that there is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for a no soul salvation. I don't have to wonder about it. I don't have to think about it. I know that my soul's been redeemed. I know my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I pray that everyone listening to this today can say this without any doubt. They are saved on their way to heaven. I pray that you'll keep your hand upon our country. Lord, send a healing in this land, I pray, and protect us in Jesus' name. Amen.